देखो बारह से बार Supersonic Slay Tadu Lati Anada di Masanji Jama Gambia Bangkokam Ise Kodo Tano Le Ibe Dao Da Birin Katon Fokoyna Andung Batatiji Hade Batatiji Ise Kodo Tano Le Kabonam Bantala Bangkoto Birin UK, Europe, USA, Canada, Switzerland Aninyi Bangkoto Maal Mu Beto Na Doku Sone Yata Atari Yata Akwaita Andung Alan Nayata Gambia Bangkokam Supersonic Slay Din Kiral Siyata Katambi Nyin Tu Maal Mu Meti Supersonic Slay Banku Tan Sabani Nani Leto Fata Fendu Bankoldo. Dung ila Google Play Store to wala ila Apple App sign sign ye Supersonics la money transfer app o download. Punke ifa muna fang na safi solda. would now call on the president of the Gambia Bar Association um, to give the welcome remarks. Mr. Salutar, please, you have the floor. Um, thank you very much, uh, my brother. Okay, so, uh, you've really made my job very, very easy. Sorry. Uh, I think you've probably, you've already pretty much um, given a fair overview of um, what will happen today. Um, not only that, I have time to you know, succinct um, remark. Uh, I stand on existing uh, protocols. Thank you for my brother. Good morning, uh, distinguished guests, participants, in person and virtual, and members of the press. On behalf of the Gambia Bar Association and our partners, I welcome you all to this public forum to discuss a very important topic. Before delving into my remarks proper, I would like to give a special welcome to Ambassador Stephen Rapp and um, Mr. Reed Brody and Taiwan Gonglo, who have come from afar to join us. We thank you very much. I also would like to welcome uh, my sister, Nene Sham, senior legal practitioner, and my sister to the left, the lady who taught me how to be an activist, Madam Fatigain. And um, of course, uh, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Professor Abdullah Sen.
my brother Gay said, after you find the truth, what next? You, we, we spend so much time, we, we go through the reports, and then what? What do, we, what, what do we expect? What do government expect to happen? Do we just kiss, make up and hug and say, we forgive each other? Or do we make sure that we have accountability? Different governments have different views about this, but accountability is beyond the victim. It's, it's about society, making sure that when we speak about never again, it is not just a mess slogan. We are trying to ensure that the culture of impunity that took root in Gambia for 22 years will never again find, find a home in the smiling coast of Africa. We, we hope that this conversation we'll have will help inform and manage expectations of the public. Through my work with Reed, Brody, Yeso, and Steve Rapp and other partners, we have engaged different stakeholders to look at the technical issues of, of, of how to support the government of Gambia with the Gambian people to, to think of and design and have a roadmap of what to do after the TRRC. And this, this discussion started about a year and a half ago, so that at least today, so that today we can speak of having tangible suggestions on the table. Without getting too much into the details of it, I would ask you to listen carefully to the different perspectives that will be brought by experts and passionate uh, rights activists from different, from Liberia, for example, my, my brother here is the president of the bar, National Bar of Liberia, he himself a victim of torture. And as he said to me before, he said Liberia is the grandfather of truth commissions and Gambia is the grandchild. So we would like to hear what are the lessons from, from Liberia. And Madam Fatu has immense experience, both as a practitioner, as, as someone who's also been very much invested and infused into dealing with victims and also dealing with fighting for rights, rights of Gambians for many, many, many years. She, her perspective will be very, very interesting. Likewise, my, my sister, uh, Nene, has been a, at the forefront of fighting when it was very difficult to fight in the Gambia, taking up a lot of many, many cases uh, of victims of, um, of the oppressive and brute regime um, in those days. And uh, I would really like to get her perspective, having dealt with a lot of uh, victims. Um, on that note, I, I would like to thank you all for your time, and I wish you a very full, fruitful and an engaging deliberation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you very much, Mr. President. Do we, are we, we have a video to show you before we start the presentation. Louis, Omar, either. The video is called Truth and Justice in the Gambia. Let's go ahead. Sorry. Now it? You'll come back, don't worry. Okay. See, this part never again, never again to life. <laughs> See? Huh? So I, I, was, I was just saying that never again to power cuts. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So please go ahead and show us the video. Here we come. The first one is on the importance of accountability in the Gambia. Is accountability important? Or do we just let everybody achieve some criminal rights violations go without any precautions? And to speak to us about this topic, we have uh, Mary Chan, our first speaker, a uh, human rights lawyer, and I think until about two years ago, she was the president of FLAG. She's been in private legal practice for more than 20 years now. So then, um, you have the floor. Please share your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, my name is Senior. Um, I would like to stand on the existing protocols. Good morning, 
ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, special greeting to our international participants, Susan and uh, the president of the Bar Association in Liberia, Patrujan, and everybody. Um, National Assembly member. This is what happens when you begin to list um, all who you observe. Um, it is my pleasure to be here today to speak. I am told I have only seven minutes, so I shall try not to bore you um, on the importance of accountability. What does it mean? It simply means bringing people to account. Simple as that. The process, the procedure, the norms, getting somebody, the structures of getting somebody, uh, holding somebody into account. Um, the importance of accountability cannot be under, under, understated. As Mr. Tal says, No, we'll, we'll do the video after the session. Yes. Go ahead. Right, go ahead. Okay, thank you. It's the gone. Mic is gone. It's going on and off. What is going on now? The mic. It's on now. It's on now. Yeah. Can you tell about I, I Okay. All right. I hope you have no problems hearing us. I'm not sure the mic is working. It's now. Yeah. It's off. Okay. It, is it working? It's... Can you hear us? Yes, now, now it's on. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? It's on here. Yeah. But it's not uh, on. Can you hear me? It says it's on, but I don't Can know. you? Can you hear us from here? I don't think you can. Yeah. It doesn't look like the mic is working. So they will have I think they're that. setting up. Yeah. That's on. Yes. Um. Oh, it keeps going on and off. I think it turns itself off. Um, yes, um, as I was saying, giving the definition so that we all know what we're talking about when we say accountability, um, basically taking uh, uh, suspects, for example, uh, through the process, the procedures of uh, accounting for their actions, basically, that's what it means. And uh, the UN Office of the Human Rights, uh, the Commissioner for Human Rights, described accountability as uh, uh, consisting of three elements. Responsibility, the responsibility of the state to prosecute, to bring people to account. And uh, holding the accused person, if convicted, uh, as responsible for having committed the crimes. The second being answerability which is uh, once he or she is uh, accused, they have to answer to the charges, answer to the allegations and accusations of having committed a crime. And thirdly, enforceability. <laughs> Otherwise, what is the point? There has to be uh, uh, the, the power, as the court has, to enforce any judgment that it may give, uh, including orders, sentence, etc. Now, in order to better appreciate the importance of accountability in our context in the Gambia, a brief reminder of why we're talking about this. For about 22 years, between, particularly between the well, 22 years of uh, <laughs> Uh, 
Can I continue? Yes. Ah, okay, that's fine. Yes, I'm, I'm saying that uh, we remind ourselves that for 22 years, we've had a regime that has been very brutal um, and responsible for um, allegedly a lot of uh, crimes against its own people. Crimes that range from murder to enforced disappearances, from rape uh, to um, other uh, violations of rights. And uh, the Gambians have been, particularly the victims, have been left traumatized, have been left wanting justice. Um, and they're struggling to understand the process. I know many are. Um, when it began, they expected their perpetrators to be arrested and taken to court right away. The Gambia chose the transitional justice uh, process, which set up the TRRC to find out the truth first, uh, reconciliation, reconcile uh, victims with per uh, per alleged perpetrators, and uh, yes, to reconcile them and give reparations if uh, where appropriate. And so um, people who live in this country, particularly the victims, can't understand why it's taken so long. But at the end of the day, we are hopeful that after the commission report, there will be justice. The commission repo uh, the, uh, the report will contain recommendations, positive ones, and we believe, and rightly so, um, that there will be prosecutions uh, of uh, persons who bear the greatest responsibilities for these crimes and violations that have occurred. Um, we have seen uh, over about 300 uh, witnesses, victims as well as alleged perpetrators and confessions. So we are not just guessing or you know, speculating. We've had confessions uh, of the most heinous crimes coming from testimonies before the uh, TRRC. Now, so then now, what, 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 why do we need accountability? The victims have gone through hell and back. They want justice, as I said. They're suffering pain, physically, mentally, psychologically, personally, directly, or in, and indirectly, because we have victims who've lost loved ones and they continue to suffer. Uh, and so that is the need to have justice and have accountability so that they can move on. It's very difficult to do that. I talk to them all the time and uh, they don't understand why it's taking so long. And uh, they want accountability. So that is one reason why we have to have accountability so that the victims can feel that justice has been done and uh, the perpetrators of the crimes uh, against them or their loved ones have actually uh, paid for it, basically. Now, our laws of the Gambia, uh, beginning with our constitution and uh, uh, the provision on the protection of fundamental rights and freedoms, as well as other laws, uh, the Sexual Offences Act, the Criminal Code, all prohibit uh, these acts of murder, torture, uh, and other serious um, crimes that have been committed against uh, the Gambians. And uh, there is the need, there's a responsibility, there is a duty on the state to prosecute uh, crimes uh, 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 when um, perpetrators are arrested and there's evidence against them. So there's a responsibility on the state to do that. Um, as well as national laws, we have international treaties that we have signed and ratified. Um, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the African Charter of uh, uh, Human and People's Rights, um, and other SIDA and other uh, international and regional instruments that require Gambia to comply um, and make sure that uh, 
these uh, crime violations are recognized as crimes and punished. Now, there's also the need to prevent conflict, to prevent violence. If uh, victims feel that nothing has come out of their suffering, they meet their perpet alleged perpetrators every day, free, there's a chance that uh, it, things might escalate because they have grievances that have not been addressed. Their loved ones have been killed. They've been maimed. A lot of them are living with a lot of pain physically and will need, perhaps need treatment for the rest of their lives. So it's important that we have accountability for these uh, human rights violations because if they go unaddressed, as I said, is a recipe for more crimes. And um, we cannot afford that situation in the Gambia. So, um, and again, why else? Accountability is a must. Yes, because the, as I said, the state has the primary duty to, pro uh, to protect its population, so it has no choice. So whether or not the, vict uh, the victim reconciles with the perpetrator, that really has not much to do with whether, whether or not the perpetrator gets, the alleged perpetrator gets punished. That is a, that is a duty. And here, you know, when I speak to a lot of people, um, some would say, why is there a need to prosecute people? I forgive him. Or he has been forgiven. We've seen the reconciliation on the TV. Uh, and so why, why do you want to, as if it's personal, and it is not, as the president of the bar says. When offenses are, uh, are committed, they are committed against the state. And the state has a duty to protect uh, uh, its citizens from, from, from uh, violations of their human rights. And um, when it is done, it, it needs to prosecute. Um, also, um, we have to send a message that, you know, impunity cannot be the order of the day anymore. International community has spoken on this. And even a lot of countries have ensured that even if they don't, there are others keeping watch to ensure that uh, perpetrators of crimes, particularly gross human rights violations, are not, uh, uh, don't get away with it. We have people like Reed keeping watch <laughs> in, in many countries and uh, Stephen. <laughs> So just, you know, to ensure that um, countries are not indifferent. Uh, we know how politicians can be like when it favors them not to prosecute. And, um, and so the message has to be sent clear that no to impunity uh, for particular crimes, particularly uh, serious crimes. Now, I just want to read, um, if you bear with me, a quote from the former UN Secretary General uh, Kofi Annan in 2006 uh, on, I think, I believe it was International Human Rights Day. He says, we have made progress in holding people to account, and this is then, for the world's worst crimes. The establishment of the International Criminal Court, the work of the UN Tribunals for Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and, and the hybrids in Sierra Leone and Cambodia, etc. Um, and the various commissions of experts and inquiry have proclaimed the will of the international community that like, such crimes should not, no longer go unpunished. And yet they still do. Unless the indicted persons are brought to court, others, others tempted to emulate them will not be deterred. Some say that justice must sometimes be sacrificed in the interest of peace. He says, I question that. We have seen in Sierra Leone and in the Balkans that, on the contrary, justice is a fundamental component of peace. Indeed, justice has often bolstered lasting peace by delegitimizing and driving underground those individuals who pose the gravest threat. That is why there should never be amnesty for crimes against humanity and massive violations of human rights. The quote concludes. So it is important to um, have the accountability. Um, and it's also important to understand that not everybody who's accused of a crime before the TRRC will be prosecuted. Um, only those who bear the greatest responsibility. And quickly, um, uh, bringing people to account, 
acts as a deterrent uh, to them and others watching because if <clears throat> nothing comes out of imagine if nothing comes out of the TRRC, recommendations are rubbish. The people that are supposed to be charged are not charged. Really, that is serious. So holding perpetrators to account uh, will also res restore confidence of victims in the justice system. They feel they will feel that they've you know, had a day in court or days and uh, the persons that are responsible for their pain and suffering <coughs> sorry, have been brought to book. Now, there is nothing new in prosecuting these cases. The state does it all the time. All the time. I mean, yeah, I'm, two minutes. All, all the time. The state does it all the time. It prosecutes people for murder, rape, on a regular basis, so there's nothing new. And finally, um, we need the goodwill of the government in order to implement the recommendations of the TRRC. And we hope that it will implement all of them uh, and uh, speed ahead as soon as possible, as soon as practically possible, because a lot of delay has already been occasioned. Um, the only choice we have is to deliver uh, justice, uh, deliver a healed and reconciled nation ready to rebuild and forge ahead. We owe it to our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren to make sure that the never again slogan is realized. I look forward to the other presentations on the uh, on the best suited uh, uh, mechanisms for, for, for this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, what we're trying to do, at least make sure we lay the groundwork, at least uh, try to make it clear how important it is that we have accountability in the country. After we will have uh, from our colleagues from uh, with uh, a similar experience, then we will come to what kind of mechanism you think is best for the ground here. But uh, you know, many made some great points, but there is one I wanted to emphasize. This is really not about the government doing anybody favors. Our constitution is clear. Uh, the treaties we have ratified are all clear, whether we're talking about treaties at the Africa level, treaties at the international level. When a crime is committed, when a right is violated, there is a duty which never changes, imposed on the state to investigate, identify the perpetrator, prosecute the perpetrator, punish the perpetrator, and make sure the victim gets justice. That never ever changes. So reconciliation cannot change that. At least it's something we have to have at the back of our mind at all times. It's a duty always imposed on the state, in this case, the Gambia government. I will now invite uh, Fatu Jain Seno, uh, my sister. I'm proud to say uh, Fatu, I think, started her human rights career with my office, HRBA, many years ago. And she's been with uh, Article 19 for quite a while, I think more than almost two decades. At the moment, she's the executive director of the West Africa office for Article 19, named after Article 19 of the Universal Declaration on Right to Freedom of Expression. Patu, uh, Senegambia's Iron Lady, you have the floor. <laughs> I'm very honored and pleased to be part of this important discussion. Good morning, everyone. We like to recognize the victims' associations and the families of victims. Uh, our National Assembly member, represented here by Tumanjai. Our friends from other jurisdictions, read, I would say, the Gambian supporter and our friend who's been with us uh, for a long time. Many people here uh, think Ridi has been there after Jamie, there have been a lot of polemic. I would like to say we've worked together quite a lot. And I want to say when things were very difficult, especially on case of Alagi Sise, uh, who was condemned and run from prison, read behind the scenes with Human Rights Watch, the Dutch and many other partners worked with us. He was hiding in Dakar for eight months. Nobody could play hand. 
we were all stressed out. And through the different networks, support, we managed to hide him for eight months. And uh, at the end of the day, it can be a change and we are all here today. So sometimes it's good to set some of the records because I think a lot of things happen on the Gambia. Today has been here with us. We work quite a lot. There have been visible faces. There have been invisible faces. There have been people who did a lot of technical work to get us where we are today. I'm also pleased to see that Dr. Sen is here. I think he's also been a great voice in the diaspora, amplifying our struggle, making sure that in the academia around the world, people will reference Gambia and will know what was happening in the country. Of course, Emmanuel, nobody will introduce him. He's been there, smeared, worked very hard from the African society, doing a lot of uh, public awareness on the TV, writing articles, setting up the coalition after the April 10. And uh, I think uh, today, where he is, I think is also part of his journey and the commitment. Um, thank you, Stephen, for helping us sharing your experience. I think we need in an open world to have all these experiences you know, to shape our journey. Our brother from Liberia, we know that we still have unfinished business, but I guess the sick, the do seeking is a big journey, it's a long journey. We Gambians are very impatient because we defeated dictator through very peaceful means. I think also we defeated dictator because we came together and we were supported by so many people. And sometimes we take these things for granted. So I think we've been having all these fora on the Gambian transitional agenda. And sometimes one wonders, we've said it all, but I think as a country who's been so close, people were suspicious of each other. Friends will not talk to each other. People will not have conversation on the phone. I think we will not have enough. We need to be speaking out. We need to be having this conversation again and again so that we will heal, but also we will come together and realize that what happened was abnormal so that what we are saying never again will be really a reality. I would not come back to the context we all know after 22 years of negation of all fundamental rights. I think the catalog of violations have been, you know, here uh, to see from the TRRC, but documented in the different reports of organizations. Many shared a lot. I think some of them went through the courts with brave lawyers who supported. I also want here to salute uh, I'm a bit biased, gay, but you will understand the women lawyers. I think they've stood when it was needed. I remember the case of Mariam Dentin, where things were very rough and many people didn't want to stand. The female lawyers were there. I remember a lot of other cases of all those sexual violence, especially during the solo sending saga. The female lawyers were there, you know, sneaking, going into the prison taking the information to the international community so that we know what was happening. So I think there's been a lot, a lot done uh, by the legal practitioners, especially women. But what I think has been the missing link is that unity that we are having today. Uh, because of the climate of fear, I think people were suspicious of each other. People didn't want to speak it to each other. And I think that has also entrenched uh, the regime, emboldened it somehow, but also uh, divided the country. So we are here with a divided country, with people still uh, negating what happened. So how do we ensure that uh, what happened remains in the archive so that our children, our grandchildren will know that during these two decades, these atrocities happened in the Gambia and it, they were committed by Gambians in most instances. Yesterday, I heard Sira mention the fact that the TRRC sold quite a lot, the reconciliation and reparation. And I think people are still uh, wondering what kind of justice we can expect. I think these are the conversations that we need to have. Another point that I want to raise is the fact that uh, we all forget, but the coalition 20, 2016 came about under the agenda of reconciliation. So the TRRC was part of the agenda and an election campaign. And uh, also, it was important that during those discussions, 
it was clear that we wanted to set up a TRRC. So what the government post Jame did was kind of a social demand, but also a commitment to ensuring that you know we will have openness and accountability. So today we are here waiting for the TRRC report. We are anticipating. We are also learning from what happened in the other countries, and I think uh, we are in the good path. This is a marathon. Sometimes, because talking to all these expert human rights, experienced uh, lawyers and advocates, I think we, we know that it's not going to be an easy journey. Because there are people who are interested in us sweeping everything under the carpet because they benefited or because they have a guilt feeling because of their action or inaction. So it's going to be a struggle to ensure that uh, uh, accountability uh, will, will happen. We see uh, a lot of impunity during uh, the past regime. Uh, opposed to Jame, we've seen some human rights violations and people were hoping that they will be addressed. Uh, until today, we've seen some reports that are in the drawers. I think that it are also not good signs for the progress, but these are post processes that have been documented. At least this is good. So, but we need to continue to push to push forward. Uh, Nene mentioned quite a lot why it is important uh, to, to, to have accountability. I also want to link it to the right to truth. It's very important, uh, the right to truth to be told. Everybody has said the TRRC has revealed a lot in us, but also a lot has been said in the TRRC, but I think a lot also is you know, not said. And this is why it's important to have proper mechanism accountability mechanism through a judicial body to ensure that the full picture is known. It will be difficult, it will take long, but at least we've seen a lot of denial. People didn't say the truth when they testify. So I do believe that we need through proper, more investigation, more hearings through courts, through cases, to other bodies to, to really get the full picture and also ensure that all those people who are responsible are prosecuted uh, in, in, in a fair manner. Um, we want to also uh, bring the issue of victims. We've been talking about it, all of us. Uh, I do believe that for a country, for the country to heal, we are very small as a country, we all know each other. And it's very difficult sometimes to be fair in the Gambia, depending on who is you know, involve. We set the rules, but we bend them. And uh, in Wolof, we say generally, Lahadom, Lahadom In 2017, at the university, we had an inaugural discussion around the TRRC. It was there. And when we said that if we want the process to work, we need to be fair. We need to treat everybody equally. And what we tend to do, and we can see it even in the recycling of officials. It depends on where you are standing, who your relatives are, who your friends are. People tend to defend perpetrators. And even people who are in the struggle, people who, were, who, who fought, fought for human rights. Because so-and-so is your family member, is your friend, so it's okay for them to be recycled because they are good people. Because that's your personal relationship with. But those people have committed things in the, you know, so you need to also, I think these have been also a challenge we've seen in the Gambia, where people protect certain perpetrators or alleged perpetrators because they are close friends or family. And I think that is also something that we need to be, you know, very careful with going forward. Um, as a country, we are too small. We need to ensure that those perpetrators will not continue to walk free in the streets because that could create revenge that will not help the victims to heal, but also that will continue to keep us in this malaise of suspicion, but also it will continue to open the wounds of the past. I think Gambians are still traumatized. Uh, we have big unfinished business. It's only for more than four years. I think it will take another decade or more for all these processes to get to a closure. So we need to be strong, we need to keep together, we need also to ensure that 
we, we keep to our goal post because I think there's been a lot of distraction. There have been also a lot of political uncertainties, but I guess these are things that will distract us for a while. But I think the longer term objective is that if we keep to our, our battle, if we keep to our principles, we will get justice for the victims. And I want also to say lastly that we need to continue to keep the victim at the heart of the process, not only for the legitimacy sake, but also I think for the ethical, you know, it's a moral imperative that whatever we are doing, we keep the victim because they suffered, they lost loved ones, they know how it feels to be in this. So the technical is great because without that, we cannot go. So we need to strike a right balance between uh, the big picture thing and also the life of the victims so that at least the, the fight will be balanced, will be you know, morally acceptable and I think we, we need to, to, to be, to be, to be uh, objective in going you know, forward. i just like also to say that all the approaches to uncovering the facts about past human rights violations are very important because they are all mechanisms for accountability. As such, they are not luxury, but precondition for those who are trying to put a history of abuse behind them and construct new society based on open dignity and respect for human rights. We need to ensure that uh, the truth is at the center so that the right to truth is fundamental in the, truth, in the accountability. We are not truthful. If the truth is not told, it will be very difficult to, 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 to get full accountability. Uh, the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Nagpili, once said, and I quote, at the core of any effort to establish accountability are the three principle, are three ind indispensable and interlinked rights. The right to truth, the right to justice, and the right to an effective remedy and reparation. And I think we've started to open up. The truth seeking has been partly completed, is partial. With all these mechanisms and all these plans, I think we will get to a fairer picture of course, reparation has started, partly monetary, uh, partly also some support, psychological and medical. This is not enough. We need more in terms of reparation. And I think uh, the monetary aspect is the, the least. I think there are more important reparation mechanisms that we need to be looking, in, looking into. And the big picture, and the, big, the most important thing now that is left, that will be the most challenging, is now the real accountability for those who are we are the greatest responsibility. And when we say that, we don't mean only Yaya Chame, we mean also the other key people, especially in the security forces. And I do believe that uh, as a way of concluding, we should not condone or allow anybody who committed serious human rights violations to continue to hold public office, especially in the security, because that will defeat the whole purpose of uh, the transition, the whole purpose of a security sector reform and also the protection of victims because tomorrow all the victims will be shot if they realize that those people who committed human rights violation are still in the uniform and they hold high office thank you very much thank you madam thank you for reminding us to look to you know push for and also to prepare those are extremely important. Again, also reminding us, uh, no matter what we do, we have to have victims at the forefront. Happy to say we have a victim association with our students. I think the chairperson of the victim service is here. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, members of this office. Then I think our good sister, uh, Sarah. I, it's now that I'm, I mean, I didn't know Professor Sayer was here. Don't blame me, because every time I see you, you lose your hand. And the mask did not help. Yeah. But you must help. So, Louis, can we please have a video? It's just about, uh, yeah, it's a seven minute video. It's called uh, Truth and Justice in the Gambia. Thank you. Louis, please go ahead. Thank <laughs> you. 
Let me try and reset. This center seems to be back. Yeah, this center. I say more than it did a great job trying to make us understand why accountability is um, important. But we all know we're not an island. There is a lot we can learn from countries that have gone through uh, a similar process in the past. And with us to share the Liberia experience is Mr. Tiawan Gonglo. Mr. Gonglo is the president of the Liberia Bar Association. And some time ago, he was also the Solicitor General of Liberia. Very well experienced, and I'm meant to understand he also was, you know, a victim of brutality that went on in that country, you know, in going to the 80s. Yeah, Mr. Gongo, it's an honor to have you here with us. Thank you. Permit me to stand on this protocol established by Brother Gay and the President of the Gambia Bar. Let me see. I didn't write what I would say today because I want to speak to you from my heart, from my experience. And I'm reminded by some of the things that were just said. There can be no excuse for accountability. Accountability is a must, and there's no option, no other option if we want to have a peaceful society. One of the reasons is that there will always be some sort of moral justification for violence by the perpetrators. In Liberia, there was a brutal military dictatorship that had victimized a lot of people who were in exile. And a crooked man who was head of GSA, the General Services Agency, who had been accused of Stealing, stealing so much money in the procurement process, Mr. Charles Taylor <coughs> organized and came to Liberia as a liberator to free the Liberian people from the repressive military regime. Although he did not intend to do any better, in fact, the experience showed that he did worse. Then, Mr. Yaya Jaman and others became part of the peacekeeping force that was organized for the first time by ECOWAS to intervene in Liberia, enforce or create a ceasefire, and monitor it. I saw Yaya Jamin myself in Monrovia. I was a member of the interim government, serving as executive assistant to Dr. Sawyer. And I saw Yaya Jamin many times. He was a captain in the military police. I still imagine him with his red band. He came back to Gambia, and we were informed in Liberia, a group of soldiers to request for their accrued service. And then the end result was a military coup. Some sort of moral reason for this action, that there was a government that was direct -like and that was not responsible in taking care of its, its soldiers. Captain Valentin Strasser from Sierra Leone returned to Sierra Leone and overthrew the government of Sierra Leone for the same reason that the government didn't take care of them. I'm saying this to say all of these things started in Liberia. And if the perpetrators are not held accountable, then others will repeat what they've done and do worse than what happened before. They are children, children of victims, who will get magnified stories of what actually happened, what, and then they will revenge beyond what was done to their parents, because they will see the entire Gambian society as co-conspirators against the parents, and they will act without distinction. 
The other thing is that perpetrators, or let me say most perpetrators, never admit they're wrong. They always justify. We've seen people appear before TRC in Liberia and say, I never kill a fly, even though they kill human beings. As a victim myself, because I was representing journalists, human rights advocates, pro-democracy activists, and opposition politicians, Mr. Taylor put me in jail one night, and the next morning I was on the stretcher going to, to the hospital with my kidneys damaged. Three days in a row, I couldn't use the electric, I couldn't use the restroom. And when the doctor showed me in the x ray, there were two blood dots. Finally, when I, by the aid of the doctor, started to urine, it was darker than anything I've seen, blood. But the man who arrested me till today says he never arrested me. And that's the thing about perpetrators. They are dishonest. Uh, even when there are three or four persons testifying against them, they still have the guts to say it did not happen. He lives in America, and I think he applied for other citizenship or, or resident, residency status. And he was confronted that Councilor Gongle, the Solicitor General of Liberia, said you arrested him and he was tortured. He actually went in the newspaper and said, the man, he named another security officer. And this young man who arrested me is even darker than me. But the man he said arrested me was so light that he looked like a mulatto. And so my response was, I've never been to a mental home. And I still remember who arrested me in the time and everything. But if this man was not prepared to admit that he arrested a human rights lawyer who at that time of his denial was Solicitor General. What do you think of ordinary people? So there has to be accountability for what happens. Liberia was the first that faced this mindless brutality against other human beings. But Sierra Leone has had its truth commission. It has put a closure to the conflict in Sierra Leone by holding those who bear the greatest responsibility accountable. So one can say there is sustained peace in Sierra Leone, and the peace in Sierra Leone is lasting. We can judge from the November trials since World War II, and people were held accountable, nothing of such nature has happened again. So there's something that we can learn from. This idea of let bygones be bygones, let's forget. Even as enlightened as I am, I have not forgotten what happened to me. And nobody has the authority to tell me to forget. That's not your business. It didn't happen to you, it happened to me. We have to take victims into consideration at all times. What happens, forgiveness is something that should be exclusively preserved for the victims, not for anyone to tell them. No one needs to summonize to them because there are people who are living with the scars, psychological, physical, economical. Some people lost whatever they had forever. And then you come and say, you know, you need to forget. You need to be forgiven. Who are you? You have no authority. In fact, to say that makes you look like you are siding with the perpetrator. The sympathy for those who say, let's forgive and forget is actually with the perpetrators, which is not fair to society. The other thing is, 
I look at it, we look at the draft yesterday. Any legal paper you you that is drafted, if three lawyers look at it, they will have three different views. Lawyers will always comment the draft that we have is a very good draft. It drew lessons from the draft that the librarians made, Sierra Leone draft, ICTRO, ICTY, everywhere. So it is, it's not unique, it's not the first time it's happening, so it's a good document. What is lacking and continues to serve as a hindrance is the lack of political will. In Liberia, the process ended two, 2009, more than a decade ago, recommendations are given. President Selif, who came to power on the campaign for protecting human rights because she was a victim herself, did not muster the political will to implement the recommendations because she was named as a perpetrator. And the best she could have done was in the interest of Liberia and peace and stability, let me resign for the process to go on. That would have been the highest moral ground. It didn't happen. And then when Mr. George Weah was in opposition, every day his party, his partisans were in the street agitating for establishment of war crimes, tribunal. They came to power and they are not talking about it again. And when people talk about it, they say, oh, that's not important now. We're talking about development, we're talking about other issues. So it's the question of political will. And we should not expect political will to come by itself. We victims, we people of Gambia and Liberia should demand political will by different actions. After all, in a democratic society, the most powerful tool that the people have is their votes. So elections are coming up in the Gambia. Let the civil society organizations here, the Bar Association, everyone, make the issue of establishment of this extraordinary court a campaign issue and compel all of the politicians to make a solemn promise. Let them declare each of the political parties that when I come to power, when the recommendations are made and prosecutions are recommended, I will implement, demand it from each of them and use it to monitor their governance in the future. It should be the single most important issue. They will never by themselves muster the will to do it because power corrupts. When people get to power, the next thing they're thinking is the next term and then they start engaging in compromises. I believe some of them have happened here in Gambia where compromises have taken place. And these compromises are against the supreme interest of the people, which is peace and stability through holding people accountable. That's all I can say to you, because I don't want you to forget that it is important for you to find ways to hold the current political actors and those who want to occupy the seats that they occupy now accountable by making them to make clear declarations in clear and unambiguous terms that they will be on the side of the Gambian people by committing themselves to accountability. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bongo. You can tell from the alignment, uh, of course, that that really was really not powerful. So for me, the message is, um, let's not do it the Liberia way. Uh, you know, uh, there were human rights violations. But unfortunately, of course, 
um, mechanisms meant to be set up, but that hasn't happened because the political will isn't there. And you know, when you keep sweeping all these things under the carpet, someday, you know, there will be an explosion. So I think that's really a very good lesson we can learn from our brother or from our neighbors, Liberia. Accountability always, and we really don't have to compromise on that. Thank you. It was an honor having you here. If the video is ready, I think we can proceed. Can we? What we want to do now, we, should, we wanted to start with the first one, truth and justice. But to make sure there is a flow, we have a video from a victim called Clema Abayfuta, who is a Chadian. We all are aware of the human rights violations that happened in Chad during the Habre era. We also know Habre was prosecuted and found guilty. So Clema is here to share his experience. If the video is ready, we can start with him. Then after that, we go to the Gambia video, just to make sure we have a flow. Because we now hear it from victims from other countries. Yeah, thank you. Freedom of uh, association of victims of uh, Senate regime. As a prisoner, I know in the uh, Senate secret uh, jail in charge. For four years, I was forced, you know, to bury my photo. They take the means in the mass grave. Several, several hundreds in all now. They do, they died uh, of disease, of starvation, and uh, after the Senate has overthrown. We began the struggle for justice. Uh, you know, it was not easy at all. We were many uh, obstacles, many difficulties. Uh, it's in a way a police attack us for what we were doing, what good job we are doing. Even our lawyers, Jacqueline Mudena, was, you know, uh, almost killed in a uh, assassination but we didn't give up. We didn't give up. I know that it is very important for you, my, my friend of Gambia, the victim of uh, Gambia, because uh, all most of politicians, politicians refuse to give us justice. We have to go to Senegal, Belgium to the United Nations, to African Union and the International Court of Justice to claim justice because it is important for a victim to claim on justice. But one more, we didn't give up because we have this conviction that we are doing a good job in the right way. Finally, after uh, 25 years um, struggling, fighting, you know, a court in Senegal convicted Senabre and uh, uh, sentenced him into life, uh, you know, prison. And uh, after the Senabre was Convicted in the, uh, 2017, we we went to Gambia. You know, um, after that day we went to Gambia. We meet uh, our friend, our brothers, with uh, more discussion because. You know, 
Jami, the last president of the council, he had his kids, you know, and uh, as he celebrated, uh, was to be brought to court, I think, and uh, I have this conviction that even Jaya Jami, of because of all he did, very bad things. He can be put to the prison or he can be brought to the justice. And I can notice that you, you began that since that day when we, we went to Gambia to meet you, we began, we began to a campaign for justice. We began to claim justice. Because it is a right, you know, the right to claim, uh, you know, justice and uh, to make it confined to the truth, you know. So, um, uh, the Ajami, the last president, uh, you know, he left the country, but when he left the country, you. And then, you know, because of folks here, because of many things, we think we again, we understood that. We understood that. Uh, and now, uh, I can say that your fight uh, to go to trade, to prove justice, regardless. Um, in my concern or of my condition is, you know, we Italian we have to bring our support to the battle to, to, be, to, to, to be on your side because this is our goal to make, you know, to be in uh, Africa, a new, a new Africa without, without you know, uh, impunity, we have to be, you know, the army without uh, load, without, you know, corruption, without the petrol. And I think that uh, we will be, because it is a good job and it is a good thing for us to, to fight and to build this, this a new nation of justice. And uh, you have to, you know, to trust us because. In that you and us, we are doing a good job. As we used to, to say in chat, Muslim and Islam, and we are together. Let the, the justice win in our Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's not this one, the first one on truth and justice in the Gambia. That's the one we're looking for. It's always good to hear from... You broke my family. Oh, good. Cool. Thank you. Yes, please. Okay. Into pieces, and then you broke so many families into pieces. My dad, when he came out, I was just 14 years old. He was against things that Yaya asked him to. Sometimes I find it so hard to understand these things. Some people liked them, loved them. And didn't believe what people were telling them. For 22 years, Yaya Jame was the president of Gambia. His role was marked by the torture and killing of dissenters, the arrest of journalists, sexual violence, massive corruption. In January 2017, Jame fled to Equatorial Guinea. And now, Details of the Jamie government's crime are coming out. Good morning, everyone. I call to order the first public meeting of the TRRC. This is an investigation into the mass atrocities that occurred in this country between 1994 and 2017. 
The testimonies that came out at the Truth Commission, the TRRC, have implicated Jamming personally in many of the worst crimes. Yeah, Jamme told you what? He told you clearly you have to secure the ringleaders. And that is what you did. Exactly. Everybody is glued to their TVs, their phones, on Facebook, just to hear from people who have killed people, from people who have tortured people. And the man said, let's kill these people and put them in place to pieces. Cut them up into pieces, like they would do me. The Gambia was a place where a dictator was operating undercover. We have also seen a lot of non members being killed in Gambia, being in prison for nothing. These people are marginalized. The order from the head of state, the former president, Yaya Jamil, they are all to be executed. One man survived to tell the story of the massacre of 59 West African migrants. After my life, I have my hand out on the road. This is God. We want to save you, tell the world what the Jamel have done to us and how they have killed us. I hope justice will be said and the perpetrators will be brought before law. Jame organized a phony AIDS program which forced HIV positive Gambians to give up their medicines and put themselves in his personal care. <laughs> On the rules of that, anyone that came for the treatment, you were told you were using ARV, you would have to stop it. Some died, no matter how much we tried. Why these people died? It's because of the length of the state and the presidential treatment program. Yeah, Daniel was very powerful and cunning. He can represent young women from former families and using state institutions and reformers to ensure that women do not take wrong. There was a whole system for you to exploit, train, rape. He said, let's see if you are a virgin. And, um, swear to God I was scared. My justice most importantly includes a whole system change so that we can prosecute this man, have our day in court. I want the next person after me to be a little less scary. Now the Truth Commission will recommend that those behind the worst crimes be prosecuted and it will be up to the government to seek Jeremy's extradition. It is the last hope for many victims. Their fear every day is that it is all going to come to naught. I urge this government to implement every single recommendation that will come out of this commission. I just have one wish. I wish I will have the opportunity to face Yaya himself and then ask him why he has to kill my dad. The list that the victim needs the truth. So the testimonies and the stories of these people makes people know who Jamme really was. Justice for all of those people means Jamme would pay for everything that he had done. Thank you. Hmm. I think that was... Well, anyway. Uh, Thank you, thank you very much. I think we've uh, uh, done with two panels. We claim all of us that we cannot run away from accountability, that this country needs accountability. We cannot, cannot have genuine healing if there is no accountability. In fact, I sometimes would say, I think the way we go as a country will depend on the way we take the recommendations of the TRRC, you know. So we have heard from our brother from Liberia, you know, explaining the danger if you don't go for accountability. It's about sweeping a lot of horrible stuff under the carpet. And we know 
there is a danger that might explode at some point. You know, Liberia did it that way. People like the Congo are pushing for that to change, but that hasn't changed yet. So making it clear to us, no matter what we do, we must not, we must never go the Liberia way. We also had from Clema, the Chad way. You know, uh, even though it took close to 18, 20 years for Mr. Harvey to be brought to justice, but we know it finally happened. And of course, that really was very, you know, important healing for his victims, as we heard from Clema. So now, for this panel, now that we all agree there is a need for us to hold certain people accountable, what kind of accountability mechanism are we really talking about? You know, are we, for example, you know, saying whoever is, you know, identified as being responsible for the most serious or the greatest violations should be dragged before the ICC? Or are we asking for the have a kind of trial, like it happened in Senegal, or the Sierra Leone kind of tribunal, as uh, it happened in Sierra Leone, or do we call for them to be prosecuted at the local level? If we call for a prosecution at the international level, what do we have in mind? A little bit of international, local level, hybrid? Or if we call for them to be prosecuted before the course of the Gambia, what kind of mechanisms do we need to put in place? Do we, for example, need to change some of our laws? Do we really need to train our prosecutors? Do we need to train our judges? All these are really very, very interesting questions. And we're lucky to have with us a group of very eminent people. We have Mr. Howard Bani, who works for the ICTJ uh, as a senior program officer. He definitely would tell us a lot about the South Africa experience. Mr. Stephen Rapp, who will be speaking um, after Mr. Howard Barney. For Mr. Rapp, when it is time to speak, I think I'll just invite me to have him introduced properly. I think he would do better than I would. And of course, we have the president of our bar association, Mr. Salutar, to also give us his thoughts as to the kind of mechanism we should go for. And Rick Brody, too, here, very much involved in the habit trial, is it? Uh, the dictator hunter. Uh, some people might want to call him, call him sorry, would also at least give us his thoughts as to what mechanism we should go for. And in addition, we also have a, you know, a short video, a BBC video, which we would want to show all of you. Please, uh, we're not uh, starting this session with any assumptions. It's really not about, you know, uh, a bunch of outsiders coming in to tell us this is what Gambia must do. That's not the issue here. It's just about sharing their thoughts. Somebody like Mr. Rapp was a prosecutor at the Sierra Leone Tribunal, was a prosecutor at the uh, ICCR. And of course, yeah, that's the Rwanda Tribunal. And at some point was, you know, the US ambassador at life for war crimes. So he has really tremendous experience. And like I said, not just him, all the panelists, so much we can learn from them. It's about telling us, this is what was done, or what was not done. Probably Gambia can look into this, Gambia can look into that. Maybe your situation is best covered this way. Just suggestion we're going to put on the table. And, as, and like I said at the very beginning, at the end of all the presentations, we definitely will be happy to hear your thoughts, or probably answer a question or two from all of you. So with that, I would, is Mr. Um, Barney available online? Please, sorry? sorry. Yeah, the other part, yes, yeah. I'm oh, sorry about that. Can we have uh, a Mr. Stephen Rapp? I'm a seller Rapp on the high table. Thank you very much, Danny, and uh, yeah. uh, Patrick Dan. So thank you. Marie, uh, can we also have you here? We already have a silent time. Yes, that's okay. You are your co organizer, so that's fine. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. That, that was, yeah. Is, is Mr. Rani ready? Um, is he ready? Uh, Brian. Brian is a right Yes, Jim Harrison, not sure if I can be seen or heard. Yes. We can hear you well. So we're starting off with you, um, the Senior Program Advisor from the ICTJ. Mr. Brian? 
you have it all. Thank you very much for joining us. You were with us yesterday, and it's so kind of you to be with us today as well. Thank you. You have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairperson. Um, firstly, my apologies that I can't be with you uh, in, in Banjul. So my short input uh, this morning is titled A uh, Dedicated Capacity for the Investigation and Prosecution of International Crimes uh, as well as Crimes of the Past. And Chair, I start with um, an observation, and that is that notwithstanding the appalling nature of atrocity crimes we've seen in so many complex situations, most perpetrators do not face justice. Um, Chair, we, we saw that um, just in the presentation uh, from our friend from Liberia. Um, typically, machineries of justice are not as expeditious, organized, or focused as the machineries behind violence. And currently, most administrations of justice are really no match for the well-oiled machines of mass atrocity. So it is time to look at ways of gearing up uh, the fight against impunity. So I want to explore uh, a broad distinction of approach between countries that leave such crimes to the whims of the general administrations of justice, such as in my own country, South Africa, uh, and those that adopt a specialized or, or dedicated uh, approach. In fact, this is the subject matter of, of a paper that is due to be launched uh, by ICBHA in, in December. And the genesis of our study emerges from efforts to persuade um, the South African government to create a dedicated capacity to investigate and prosecute apartheid era crimes, which have been long neglected. Um, some of you might be aware, we, we have our own um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission and several hundred murder cases were referred by RTRC to the prosecution authorities and they were virtually all abandoned. So the starting premise in our study is that the generalized approach to crimes of the past almost always underdelivers, whereas the dedicated approach tends to produce results. Specialized or dedicated prosecutorial and investigative capacities are entities created to focus exclusively on a particular category of crimes. They are typically located within a prosecution authority, perhaps in the police service or other state agency, or even an independent body. And personnel attached to such units tend to be recruited for their demonstrated expertise and experience. The rationale behind the establishment of, of such specialized units um, are, are a few. So, for example, you establish these units to concentrate and centralize national efforts under one organizational entity to facilitate coordination, exchange of information and leads, and to establish clear lines of, of responsibility. The buck has to stop somewhere. If it's in a generalized system, uh, the buck simply doesn't stop with anybody. We also want to have motivated and well-capacitated, skilled investigators and prosecutors with the necessary expertise. We want to promote specialized and focused attention on identified cases without being distracted and diverted onto other matters. In South Africa, as, as a legal representative for many victims, often knocking on doors of prosecutors, Time and time again, we were told they have more important cases to deal with, more current cases. And ultimately, you want to foster close cooperation between investigators and prosecutors. So in our study, we focused on um, looking at a comparative survey of specialized units around the world, and we came across at least 23 of such units. Um, we, we noticed that there were historical units. These are units set up to investigate crimes of the past. Um, th there are at least eight of these units, such as in Australia, Argentina, Poland, Germany, Bosnia, Serbia, Croatia, and Lithuania. 
Um, we also discovered that there were these units which we've called new generation units, often set up when countries uh, wish to implement their obligations under their own statute, and sometimes to invoke the principle of universal jurisdiction to pursue um, international crimes. And there are at least eight of these units in Belgium, Sweden, France, Germany, the Netherlands, the Norway, the US, um, and the UK. We also came across uh, what we refer to as mixed mandate units. Um, typically, these units would be investigating historical cases, the crimes of the past, as well as more current international crimes. We came across six such units in Canada, Uganda, Finland, Switzerland, and Denmark. And then we, we looked at those countries which didn't adopt a specialized approach, such as in Peru, the UK, Kenya, and Tunisia. So our research suggests that countries with specialized units are likely to achieve considerable more success when compared to countries with art dedicated capacities. Indeed, there appears to be a direct correlation between the numbers of serious international crimes prosecuted and the existence of specialized units. Those countries with dedicated capacities pursued higher numbers of cases than those without. So countries with de dedicated capacities, such as Argentina, Germany, and France, have reasonably impressive track records compared with those that left crimes of the past and international crimes to the vagaries of the national criminal justice system. So looking at a few of the countries which um, didn't adopt specialized approaches, starting with Peru, um, there you had prosecutors dealing with cases uh, referred by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, and yet time and time again, they were deflected uh, from handling these cases because they were directed to devote their attention to pension and tax fraud cases. The United Kingdom adopted a very disjointed approach to the troubles in uh, Northern Ireland, um, and their disjointed approach saw only nine cases out of more than 900 referred to the Public Prosecution Service being prosecuted with no convictions. Um, Kenya failed to establish a specialist capacity to investigate and prosecute the post-election violence of 2007, and that resulted in total impunity for those who orchestrated that carnage. So while Tunisia established a specialized criminal chamber uh, within its judiciary to deal with crimes committed during the Ben Ali regime, they somehow neglected to equip those chambers with a dedicated investigative and prosecutorial capacity. And the results speak for themselves. After three years of, of work, um, not a single verdict has been delivered of the Tunisian specialized chambers. In our study, we, we interviewed 10 practitioners in, in the field, and if I may quote one of them, um, Stephen Rapp, who coincidentally is our next panelist, he explained why ordinary law enforcement and prosecutorial agencies are not in a position to effectively investigate and prosecute crimes of the past. He said, you fundamentally run into problems if busy prosecutors, complicated cases, Lots of different priorities, understaffing, inadequate legal and justice systems, not to mention the specialized skills that are necessary to put these cases together. The fact that they're involved in different kinds of complex crimes committed in different ways by organizations. You need a detailed understanding of the structures of power and violence. Who really pulled the strings? Who went along for the ride? All of those things take real multidisciplinary skills which are not going to be available within an ordinary office that's dealing with crimes of all sorts. So in our study, we come to, to certain conclusions, but that is that crimes of the past are unlikely to see the light of day unless a country takes certain steps. Firstly, a country ought to create a dedicated and specialized investigative and prosecutorial capacity. 
It needs to provide strong material and political support to the entity established and its objectives. It should promote prosecution-led multidisciplinary investigations with close collaboration between investigators and prosecutors under one roof. And Chair, these steps should be taken regardless of what model of accountability is ultimately chosen in the Gambia, whether it be a special hybrid court or a special chamber within the judiciary, or simply before the ordinary courts of the Gambia, a dedicated investigative and prosecutorial capacity focused exclusively on these cases will be needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you um, very much, Mr. Wally. I think you really did justice to your paper by, you know, making references to so many countries around the world, at least sharing the experiences of those countries from Kenya to the UK to Peru, Tunisia, etc. Thank you. Um, so we now uh, will move on to our spe second speaker, Mr. Stephen Rapp. And for Mr. Rapp, I think I'll let Mr. Reed <laughs> introduce him to the audience. <laughs> because he did yesterday, and I don't think I can mind that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gay. Thank you. Um, we are very lucky. Stephen Rapp is a legend in, in the field of transitional justice. Um, there, in, in addition to having been the uh, war, the uh, uh, Barack Obama's ambassador <clears throat> for the for, for war crimes, in addition to being the former prosecutor of the Sierra Leone Tribunal, the chief of prosecutions under Hassan Jallo of the Rwanda Tribunal, um, there is not a transitional justice uh, uh, not the, in the world today. That, that Stephen is not involved in. Um, and I found that, yes, two days ago, that he'd been to 141 countries. Um, although he counts them, the way he counts them is not the way I would have counted them. But um, in any event, I mean, Stephen was in, was with Clema Abayfuta in Chad. He came to Senegal several times. He was the person who really spearheaded the US's involvement in the Hissan Habre case. Um, and um, just talking to him, and, and I'm sure as you will hear, um, it, it's just a wealth of, of, of knowledge, but also of, 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 of genuine commitment. This is a man um, who has a passion uh, for, for, for seeing that victims receive justice. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, uh, Reed, for that, for that introduction. And, and, and it's good to be with, uh, uh, with group keep slipping off. Uh, good to be with all of you and, and, and back in, in Gambia. I was here uh, uh, 13 months ago, uh, even during uh, COVID, uh, following all the rules. So the ferry wasn't running, so I uh, rode a pirogue over the, over the river uh, and uh, engaged uh, with a number of you at that time. And of course, when I was uh, a prosecutor of special, special work for Sierra Leone uh, down the coast, uh, I was often in the Gambia, frankly, because uh, uh, we had witnesses from the Gambia and people who were endangered in Sierra Leone for their testimony and whom we relocated uh, to this uh, to this country. Um, uh, Gay said earlier, um, you know, talking about those of us that come from outside who are here speaking with you, uh, 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 please understand we're not here to tell you what to do. Uh, this is your country, your decision, your future. Uh, all I can do is to share the experiences that I've had working in other places, the mistakes that we've made, the successes that we've had, uh, and, and then help you in developing the tools to do exactly the job that you decide needs to be done. That, that's that is what it's all about. Now, you, I remember when I was here last time and I was at the Victim Center and gave a press conference, I, I spoke of the value of the hybrid model and of course, uh, Johnny's friend said, oh, he's telling us, telling you that's what you need to do. He's uh, uh, bringing his justice uh, uh, to, uh, to the Gambia, not your justice. Uh, but I was uh, uh, talking about hybrids, and I'll talk about that again today, uh, because this is a tool that you can use. On the other hand, the advantage of the hybrid approach is you can use just the parts of it that you want. 
and you can design it uh, and, and work out uh, uh, the, the, the situation in order to, to deal with any deficiencies uh, or any problems with the current system uh, in, in taking care of, of, of these cases. Uh, my own experience, you've heard I was the special court prosecutor. We, I was the one that brought trial, uh, I finished the, the prosecutions of the, of the nine uh, defendants that we tried in Freetown and, and started and, and ran through the prosecution case uh, against Charles Taylor, a case that we, for reasons of security, uh, moved outside of Freetown, moved uh, actually uh, to The Hague, though we had hoped to move elsewhere in Africa. Uh, but, um, you know, I had that experience in, in that court, which is a mixed court, a hybrid court. Uh, but I had also worked previously uh, for eight years as a federal prosecutor uh, in my own country as a United States attorney in my home state of Iowa in the, in the 1990s, uh, before I went to the Rwanda Tribunal for six years, where I started as a senior trial attorney leading the trial of those responsible for the hate media. And, and then when Hassan Jallo was appointed uh, a prosecutor of that court in 2003, uh, the following year, he, he promoted me to the chief of prosecutions, which uh, meant leading uh, uh, all, of the, all of the trials uh, uh, in more than, a, of a more than a dozen trial teams where we were prosecuting 75 or so leaders of, of, of the Rwandan genocide. Uh, then thereafter, I was appointed by Kofi Annan to become the chief prosecutor of Sierra Leone court. Now, the, the difference between Sierra Leone and the Rwanda tribunal is we were a mixed court. We were a hybrid. We were not a court established by the UN Security Council, which is what happened with the Rwanda tribunal and the Yugoslavia tribunal. Instead, it was a court that was established because Sierra Leone wrote to the UN and said, help us establish a court. And there ended up being an agreement between the UN and the government of Sierra Leone that was approved by the parliament of Sierra Leone. It was a treaty. And under the terms of that treaty, it was possible to do things that it would not have been possible to do under the laws of Sierra Leone. Uh, Sierra Leone had head of state immunity. You couldn't prosecute a Charles Taylor. Uh, they'd never adopted a war crime statute. They'd never adopted a crimes against humanity or torture statute. And they certainly didn't, if they, if they went ahead and did it, uh, after the fact, that would have violated their constitution. But if we had an international court, we could use international law that was in effect during the 1990s when these crimes uh, were committed. Uh, and, and we also were able to do things much more flexibly than possible at the, uh, at, at the Rwanda Tribunal. For one thing, we could use far more people from Sierra Leone, and 65% and of the employees were Sierra Leoneans. And unlike the Rwanda tribunal that tried its cases over in Tanzania, 800 kilometers from the scene of the crime, we tried all the cases except for Taylor uh, in, in Freetown, within sight of where many of the horrific crimes uh, were committed. And the court had a mixed jurisdiction. Uh, uh, my, I was the prosecutor appointed by the Secretary General of the UN, the deputy prosecutor that I saw that, that came in under, under my uh, administration, uh, was appointed by the president of, of Sierra Leone, uh, Joseph Camaro, who was later Minister of Justice. Uh, he was the deputy, and the judges were mixed between, uh, uh, between uh, international and national judges. And of course, many of the international judges came from, from elsewhere in, in Africa. It, it still was imperfect, because I frankly, even as an international, thought we were too international, <laughs> that, we, uh, that we were too separated from the national system. We didn't do everything that we could so I tried to work on it to, to develop a, a stronger relationship with the national system so that we'd leave a legacy, a rule of law and an ability to, uh, to deal with, uh, with cases. But of course, many of the people in the court, like Joseph Kamara, others who were ju judges and prosecutors, uh, went, moved uh, back into the Sierra Leone system, as did the police, and, and have benefited uh, uh, maintaining the rule of law in that country and going after cases of public corruption. And, and, and creating a situation where we had a country where twice political power has changed between the two major political parties uh, without, with, without uh, lethal violence. So uh, I think it was a success uh, to, to that extent, but uh, it leads me always to the point of view that I would prefer to have things done as close as possible to the scene of the crime, as close as possible to the national system and only add international elements to the extent that they're strictly necessary. 
Now, our friend Howard here a moment ago talked about specialized units, uh, and, and these can be developed, as in most of the cases that he discussed, within national systems. And, and you establish a special prosecutor's office, a special division of the police, and then certainly a special division of the courts. And, and sometimes that's sufficient uh, to, to do the job. If you don't do that, as, as he said, if you just say, oh, well, these can be handled within the normal court system, one day the judges will be hearing an, an ordinary uh, bank robbery or, or some other kind of crime, uh, the next day <laughs> they're gonna be hearing uh, uh, about uh, crimes committed by a, a, a dictatorship and, and a, a security structure. Uh, at, uh, over the course of 22 years. Well, those are quite different kinds of crimes, and you can't easily transfer the sort of ways in which crimes are committed by individual perpetrators on the spur of the moment with the ways that they are actually done by a whole organized security system led by a dictator uh, where uh, sometimes explicit orders aren't given uh, and where there's a whole machinery uh, in, which, uh, in which the crimes are, are, are committed. So these are very different things, and, and you need that kind of specialized knowledge, as he said. But beyond that, there can be issues that really require you to have some internationalization. Now, how do, how do you get to internationalization is, is sort of the Sierra Leone formula. It would be a formula of the people of this country, basically, uh, you know, through the leadership that, that you elect, saying, uh, let's, let's, get down, let's sit down with ECOWAS, for instance, or with the African Union or with the UN, but uh, preferably with ECOWAS, because obviously we have ECOWAS victims and the Ghanaians that we, were, that we all know about, and we just saw the survivor of those, of those killings that happened 15 years ago. But you work out an agreement with an international organization, and you approve that agreement. And in that agreement, there's a statute for the court. And, and that court then... Uh, uh, provides uh, that statute then provides how the court would, would take place. And then there's also the question of how it's financed. And, and of course, doing these things uh, right and, and making sure that there's the security, that there's the adequate investigation, that there's witness protection, uh, and that people have good defense, uh, all of those things are expensive and, and they require a, a most often assistance of, of, of donors. And, and most often these committees, these courts then have donors committees of international donors that review budgets and make sure that uh, though it's a constant process of, of pushing for, for funding, uh, that there's funding to provide for the necessary uh, components of, of the court. But the, but the management of, of the court is, is, is the way it's decided uh, in, in the agreement that would be negotiated by this country uh, and, and, and the international body. And, and, be frank, I think uh, if the leadership that's elected uh, on December 4th and, and, and others go forth to ECOWAS and say, this is what we want, <laughs> I think it's, it's frankly a situation where ECOWAS would say, yes, we will assist and be the, be the partner in that and agreeing to it to make it an, an internationalized accord. Now, the question about internationalization, why do it and how much of it to do? There's, there's really three basic problems or deficiencies that require internationalization. In other words, the creation of a hybrid between national and international. One is because of, of legal limitations in the national system. Two is because of capacity limitations in the national system. And three because it's because of doubts or concerns about the will uh, within the national system uh, to provide what's needed to deliver independent justice. And in, in a number of situations, you see you need, you've got deficiencies in all three places. Uh, Reed, of course, is very active and I helped support the effort in, in, um, uh, in the Habre case in Senegal. And of course, that was not a trial that occurred or was to occur in the country where the crimes were committed. Habre had emptied the treasury and gone, been overthrown, <laughs> he'd been overthrown and then emptied the treasury and, and moved uh, to, to Dakar uh, in, in 1990 and had tried to buy himself as much protection as he could in Dakar. Uh, but the victims eventually came there or eventually stopped uh, by decisions of the Supreme Court of Cruz de Cassacion in, in Dakar. 
continued to fight for, for justice, got a case going in Belgium, and eventually there was a summit here in, in Banjul in 2006 that called for Senegal to try Habre in the name of Africa. Senegal passed a statute to do that, but in 2010, the ECOWAS court, the, the, the court, the human rights court really, or uh, regional court, said that it would violate his human rights for Senegal to do it on its own because it was a retroactive statute. They passed the statute in 2007. He committed those crimes in 1984 to, or 1982 to 1990 over in Chad, and that you couldn't do. But if there was an international court, <laughs> then you could. And so there, there, you know, as far as capacity was concerned, there were donors ready to help Senegal. As far as judges, the Senegalese judges are ready to go. Uh, they didn't really have, I mean, Abre bought some influence with certain groups up there, but, but, uh, but he had, uh, uh, you know, we, we trusted the Senegalese judges to do an honest job here. So there wasn't really the problem of, of capacity. And there wasn't the problem of will, but there was a big legal problem. And so it was possible to negotiate an agreement between the AU and Senegal that basically overcame the legal problem, it became an international court with the statute. Uh, it would only have a little bit of internationalization, the statute and one judge that would be from another African country that would preside at trial, a guy from Burkina Faso, uh, another judge who would preside at appeal, ended up being a judge from Mali. And that's what, what proceeded there. And that was sufficient to overcome the problem. Here in, 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 uh, uh, in Gambia, you have a constitution of 1997. Now, I was here last time just as the constitution, the new constitution, the proposed constitution, the draft, uh, didn't get the three quarters of support that it needed in parliament. I hope that uh, that comes back next time. I very much hope that it does. But uh, we have to live with the reality that the 1997 constitution may still be the constitution we deal with. And that constitution says if, you, if, if this court were to want to try Jame, it would take a two-thirds vote of parliament to overcome that. Uh, that would make it very political, make it much more difficult to prosecute him than others. Uh, there is a requirement of two levels of, of, uh, of, of, um, uh, of review. I mean, you know, it's cumbersome enough, but to have to create two appeals courts for this process would be, would be a complicated thing. The, there's no uh, uh, torture law uh, in a time. There's no forcible disappearance or enforced disappearance law that was in effect at the time that John May was in power. Uh, and, uh, and that would be retroactive if you put that into effect, and retroactive is against the constitution of this country. On the other hand, there was international law in effect at all the times Habre was doing, or excuse me, Habre was doing his crimes and that John May was doing his alleged offenses. And so uh, potentially by having an agreement, uh, you can apply international law uh, and, and, and avoid this. Now, I know we were talking yesterday with Ami Ben Suda and others, that, you know, how, whether, how this would have to be formalized, because if it basically had to go back into the Gambian Supreme Court, it would say, no, you can't do this, that would, be, would make it pointless. But clearly, Gambia has entered into the ICC statute, and under the ICC statute, you can try heads of state, you can do all of these things, and that's a treaty-based court too. So here we're imagining that, and we have the Sierra Leone precedent and the Habre precedent that basically says, if you do a, a, an agreement with, a, with an international organization, apply a statute, the statute complies in all respects with international law, you can overcome the limitations in a constitution like the one of 1997. So that's a major reason to look at, at this idea. Then there's the capacity issue. And uh, uh, of course, uh, as was noted, we might be able to overcome capacity simply with a specialized division of, of, of police and, and uh, prosecution and judges. But um, the, the challenge then would be getting the donor funding to the right place. Some donors like to do training programs. Some might provide a digital equipment. Some might do this. Some, but in the end, there's not enough to really uh, to, to support adequately the kind of investigation, the kind of witness protection and everything and, and victim services that is needed. And so the, uh, it is valuable to have an international court that can cover, an, uh, with an internationalized budget, that can cover all of these needs. Additionally, an internationalized court, a hybrid court, is going to have more influence in terms of 
for instance, getting Jame from Equatorial Guinea. If it's just a question of Gambia saying, please send him, that's one thing. If it's an ECOWAS court saying, send him, that's more. If you're talking about protecting witnesses and, and somebody's at risk, uh, it's much easier to be able to organize to send them to, to Ghana or Sierra Leone or Nigeria or somewhere if it's an ECOWAS court. Uh, if you're seeking assistance of, of, of governments in Europe, et cetera, it, it can be, and, and in North America, that can also be a, a, a value going with that approach. Uh, finally, there's the issue of, of will. And, uh, and, and I think here, uh, certainly from listening to this uh, uh, audience and, and uh, speaking and knowing so many of you and hearing the speeches, I know there's profound will to do this, but sometimes there's, there's not the will to follow up and, and to do it and to fulfill the mandate and, and uh, presidents run for for re-election and, and uh, make promises and, and, and the process runs out of gas, so to speak. And, uh, and, and having a court like this that establishes a mandate, a, a strategy that, can, that decides how many people are going to be prosecuted and how long it's going to take, I think ensures that you're going to have a more complete and, and independent process. So uh, those are the reasons to look at this, at this particular tool. But of course, it has to be adapted uh, to what works here within uh, within the law. And, and I'll say for my own part that I'm ready to come back here <clears throat> for as long as I draw breath and, and can ride in a pirogue or, uh, uh, you know, uh, manage to, uh, to get here uh, and to work uh, with the victims, who's always, in my view, the people with a paramount interest in this. Uh, but I'm also not just thinking of the victims uh, that, uh, of crimes that happened between 1994 and 2017. I'm thinking of other victims those that could be victimized in, in, the, in the 2030s or 2040s or 2050s in, in the future, unless the rule of law is established, unless a clear message is sent that if you do these crimes, there are going to be consequences. And, and uh, I was so pleased to see my good friend Tiawan Ganglo, who was such a great partner when I was prosecutor of special court for Sierra Leone, and we were prosecuting the former president of his country, not for the crimes he committed in Liberia, but for the crimes he committed in Sierra Leone. Uh, but uh, his clear message that there really is no alternative uh, to justice uh, if you want to prevent these crimes in the future and you want to respect the rights of the victims. Uh, the, the, the bygones be bygones approach, easy as that might be, basically just invites another to do the same thing in the future. So uh, to prevent that is the reason I'm engaged still all over the world now supported by the U.S. Holocaust Museum under its theme of never again. Of course, that's a promise often broken, but we've got to make sure that that, uh, that, that promise is kept. And I'm willing to ready uh, and willing uh, to continue to, to work with you to make sure that the promise of justice uh, is kept uh, here in the Gambia uh, so that these crimes will will never happen again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lab. I think that was really, really helpful. You know, as we think about the mechanism we feel is best for the Zambia. But we also have very much taken note of your offer to assist, and we definitely would be, you know, uh, we would be in touch, I'm sure. Thank you. Uh, so now I would invite Mr. Sanitar. Uh, the president of the Gambia Bar Association to uh, share his thoughts on mechanisms that is best suited for our country. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, uh, Murundi. I mean, after having heard uh, Stephen Rapp speak, uh, his wealth of experience and expertise, where do I start? <laughs> But I'm really, um, I'm really honored and privileged to really have access to um, some of the finest minds as far as um, personal justice is concerned. I'm very fast to have it. And, uh, I'd like um, Dr. Alex, uh, Dr. Masura said, uh, it is for Gambians to decide what kind of what one of the most valuable that we have to think of is a foregone conclusion, and what type of accountability Gambia should want. It is a, 
Gambian question and the question of Gambian asking. Of course, we have friends who will help or will be help us in the process, but we must own the process. Um, nobody should tell us or teach us the importance of ensuring that what happened in 20 years should never happen again. I don't think we need to be told by anyone because we Gambians and our families bore the brunt of that 22 years. And um, now, what type of accountability is suited for Gambia? I, I would deconstruct construct the question so that I can go backwards and then I can from there we can come to where we should get to in my opinion. I mean the victim it must be victim centered. The victim are at the center first and foremost. So whatever me mechanism you have must first and foremost tick the victim box. It, it must be victim centered. Number two it must have local ownership. To have, legit to, to, to have legitimacy, it must be locally owned, driven. Because if it's not locally owned and driven, one, it will not be legitimate, two, it will not be sustainable. So it's very, very critical for whatever system you have, to have local ownership, to have, so that you can have legitimacy, so we can own, drive, and sustain it. Since we're talking about accountability, must bring about justice. Those who, who's, who were victims must have their day. They must have justice. So these are the three principles I think should underpin any accountability mechanism we have, or we should have post the RRC. Now, bringing back the question, Ideally, if our court systems are able to achieve this, then we will not be having this discussion. If you had a very robust court system, they could take down the three boxes. I think the previous uh, Mr. Vani, when he was presenting, has even shown that some of these advanced countries even fall short of being able to take these boxes. So I think, um, one, our court system does not, our court system, which is adversarial, there's no space for a victim. The victim is just a witness. I mean, victims, I mean, I'm sure uh, the family of Solo Sandan will tell you, or, or, um, or Koro Sise, let the Solo rest in peace. They even struggle to get information about the court dates. Sometimes we get calls from abroad, when is the next court date? I mean, they have no space in that, I mean, adversarial gladiator, two lawyers fighting, I mean, prosecutor and defense environment. It is very, it's not victim friendly. So our, our adversarial system clearly is not victim friendly. And not to mention things like even witness protection, all those things don't exist at all, at all in our system. Our laws are inadequate. Torture is not a crime under Gambian law. Enforced disappearance is not a crime under Gambian law. Our constitution has clauses that says um, anything that was not a crime before cannot be made a crime today. So today, if you have a statute that says torture is a crime, it cannot ap apply retroactively. Our constitution grants um, uh, this head of state immunity that has to be lifted by three quarters of the National Assembly. Imagine having to go to parliament before you've been charged with damage. And you know what happened to our constitution, as important as it is. It is. So our legal system and framework it's not fit for purpose. It was not designed for democracy. It was designed to perpetuate a dictatorship. So we cannot rely on that um, to, if we have to um, bring those people who bear the difference, but we, we can't, we can't, because the law is simply not adequate. And in fact, it's, it's a hurdle for us. Um, for that purpose, and also we, we have to get the political will and support. It is, unfortunately, it is easier to get the political will support when you have the international community supporting you, if you have the regional bodies like ECOWAS supporting you. I mean, you are more likely to be listened to. In 2016, we were, we were all shouting here, Gamas decided, Gamas decided. What happened? When the regional forces came up, those things in combination with our local efforts, 
is the reason why we restore our democracy. So the regional, the re, the regional element is very critical because it gives us, it amplifies our voices. So having a court that has a regional backing would be would actually be very very important. One, as um, Stephen Raff said, in terms of asking for Gambia's extradition. Imagine Gambia asking for, going to Equatorial Guinea asking for Gambia's extradition. We have court cases. We cannot even serve Jame. We cannot even serve him any process up to today. If Ecowas speak to Obiang or his son, it's a different kind of discussion. So it's very important that whatever court we have must have that regional force and backing. So it's not only Gambia. Remember, at least six ECOWAS nationals have been identified as um, being um, victim victims of Jame. I mean, this is just from the TRRC. It could even be more. So that regional backing is critical. So if you look at all these um, three factors, victim-centered, local ownership, and the need to achieve justice, the question is, can we have that within our system? I think I would say it's, it's an emphatic no. That is why it is important to know why the hybrid model is best suited um, for our country because it will, it will help us achieve our goals as a country in the sense that we can have we can de design it in a way that it will have as much local content as possible and only inter internationalized to the extent needed. So everything that we that we can have locally that can be gambinized, that can be fit for purpose, we have it. Anything that we don't have, we can tap tap outside. So we can have the best of both worlds. It is not something that is being brought and imposed upon us. It is something that we will design. And we, and we have a lot of Gambian experts in this. I mean, I think Gambians have the highest per capita experts in the TJ process, I can say that for sure. So we have a lot of brilliant Gambians who are doing it from East Timor, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, you name it. We've been doing it for a very long time. So we have the capacity, capacity to bring great Gambian minds together, plus the local capacity, plus our friends, so we can really design a, a, a system that will work for us. I mean, so for me, it's a question of being able to get the political will. Because after all it's said and done, we have we have we have um, this process that we started, we've, we've actually brought the best minds in the world, literally <coughs> speaking, the best mind in the world have come together, written option papers, even drafted a model hybrid court rules. I mean, these are people who drafted rules for courts in Rwanda, I mean, Sierra Leone, and even from in, from in Europe. We have the best minds have come together to help Gambia at no cost, zero cost to the government of Gambia. All we want to do is we wanted to say, this is, if, 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 these are the options you choose. If you want to do it, these are the other options you can take. And we have people who are able to help you build your capacity so that you can do it and do it together. So now the question is, Will we get the political will? And without the political will, like my brother in Liberia, who I met, I mean, I met him three weeks ago. I was, I attended a conference in Liberia on ECOWAS trying to start a TJ process, and that's the first time I met him. And, and when he spoke, it, it touched my heart. I said, I have to bring you to Gambia. Because in Liberia, after all the work that's been done, 10 years down the line, I mean, it's business as usual. Vested interests transcend national interest. We are seeing exactly the same signs in this country. So it's important that we learn and we demand, we demand our servant leaders to ensure that this TRRC, it transcends politics, regardless of who is president of Gambia after 4th of December. They, they must, we must demand that they must implement the DRC um, report, recommendation. They must put in place a court that will ensure that those who bear the greatest responsibility are held accountable so that tomorrow any soldier or government official or even private citizen will think twice before using the state or, or take directives to hurt their fellow Gambians. On that note, I thank you all. Thank you.
Right. It was a good headline. Uh, <laughs> I can I can sign it off. <laughs> oh, he calls for a hybrid system. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much. I think that really was yeah. So we will watch um a BBC video, and then after that we will hear from our good friend Mr. Nkodi. Um, I will say the video is called the Mo the Mother of West African Migrants. Focus on the media. Please go. A little over a year since President Yaya Jame fled the Gambia to live in exile. He's currently in Equatorial Guinea. Now, human rights investigators say they have evidence which could be used to bring Mr. Jame to trial on murder charges. Now, if they succeed, it will be down to the determination of the only survivor of one of the worst massacres of Jame's 22 years in power. Thanks to us, traveled to Central Ghana to meet him. Here is his story. This cemetery is where Martin Chile's dream is buried. He wanted to go to Europe. On the way, in the Gambia, he met with the brutality of Yana Jamis regime. The migrants were accused of being part of a coup plot. In the middle of the night, they were taken to be shot. Only Chile got away. I jumped from the pit to the police and I heard the man from the going that, but I did not lose that. And yes. the man Jame reluctantly left the Gambia after 22 years in power. He fled to Equatorial Guinea. The time I was about to jump from the cup and I tell the guys, my hand is no more in the book. I get my hand and I go. Who want to save you? Because he said the word. What he has done after, and how he killed us. Martin Chile launched his mission. He travelled hundreds and hundreds of miles around Ghana. He painstakingly traced mothers, widows, brothers, and sisters. What's happening in this room today is historic. Martin and the victims' families are for the first time meeting international and local human rights campaigners. Their mission now is to fight for former President Yaya Jabi to be extradited from Equatorial Guinea to face justice here in Ghana. An investigation by regional body ECOWAS found the migrants were killed by rogue elements. We have new information and it is clear that the migrants were not uh, killed by rogue elements, but that they were murdered by a paramilitary death squad, the junglers, that took its orders directly from Yaya Jamin. 13 years on, Martin Chile has yet to find all the relatives. For what he has done, I want justice. On behalf of my friends, <coughs> so I want to see Yaya Jamin in prison. Martin Chile never got to Europe. His dream is bigger now, to prove that one citizen's efforts can bring a leader to justice. Alex Kumar Smith, BBC News in Ghana. Well, the Africa Centre for International Law and Accountability has told the BBC that the evidence against former President Jame is substantial and sufficient to force his extradition to face charges. The BBC's Thomas Nadi has been speaking to the organization's executive director in Ghana's capital, Accra. The people who committed these crimes uh, were under direct orders uh, by the president, Yaya Jack. Uh, this is the group that's called the junglers. And these junglers uh, take direct orders from Yaya Jack. How can you be sure that former president Yaya Jack gave the direct orders? The facts and circumstances, as narrated by uh, 11 of the officials that were directly involved, uh, suggest that when all of these was happening, and they were in direct contact with the former president. Has there been any response from the former president? We put out this information today. Um, there has been no response yet, but we expect that uh, he might come up with a response in his uh, exile state uh, of Equatorial Guinea. What will have to happen for there to be an establishment? First, uh, we would encourage the state of Ghana to 
uh, prior to independently establish the facts which have been put forward. And then after that, uh, based on the nature of the facts and the evidence that they also uncover, uh, they will uh, seek uh, an extradition request from Equatorial Guinea. Now, isn't it wishful thinking that the Equatorial Guinea will grant your extradition request? It's a legitimate question, but depending on the law that we are using, and some of this is uh, enforced appearances, uh, also torture was involved. And under the torture convention to which the Equatorial Guinea uh, has ratified, uh, the state of Equatorial Guinea, if an extradition request is sent to them, will be under an obligation and international law to extradite or prosecute. Have you met the president of Ghana? We have met with the president, and uh, you know we're quite hopeful that the president was, you know, was, was going to be a seized of this matter. Uh, we can say uh, without going into the details of our discussion. Uh, that the president was engaged. Dear Gambian and his national friends, give me a <laughs> great stop. pleasure to address can this you, conference we have a, on the implement. Can you, that's for the next panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, the last speaker on this panel is our good friend, Mr. Lee Brody. You know, you have uh, from uh, about the ISM on that. Um, the, the Lee's involvement in everything that did not start after 2016. He was very much there before 2016, particularly when some of our activists, some of our victims, needed him the most. Reed is a lawyer uh, with a wealth of experience, you know, very much involved in the Abre trial. I think the involvement went over 20 years. Still going on. Yeah, still going on, yes, yes. I mean, worked for the ICJ. Still yeah. Action. yeah, that's right, for so many years. So really, I'm sure uh, most people in this room know who you are. So we have the floor. We really would want to hear your thoughts on what mechanism you think is best under the circumstances for the Gambia. Thank you, Gay, and thank you, everyone. I will be very brief because I, uh, 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 people have said the main things. The reason we wanted to show uh, this video in addition to showing how much weight I lost since then, um, was that to, to, to highlight the regional aspect of this case. Um, the worst massacre of the Yaya Jame period was the case against the migrants. We believe that 59 West African migrants were killed here, over 40 from Ghana, nine from Nigeria, three from Senegal, two from Togo. Vaccine. President of Equatorial Guinea um, to to uh, to uh, say no. Now we met with and Aisha Jame was with us when when we when William Nyarko and, and others we met with the president of Ghana Nana Kufo Addo, and uh, he he was very he was of course the foreign minister at the time of the massacre and he came here he was run out of town by Yaya Jame, um, who later uh, in the press mocked uh, uh, 
who later in the press not mocked Nana Akufo Addo. Please. Um, so, it, you know, it's, 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 imp Ghana did not move forward with this case because they said it was really up to Gambia. Um, but the point is that if Gambia has the political will to move forward, if Ghana, if Nigeria join, then we have, I think, the possibility of creating this regional mechanism. The two other points I want to make quickly are, um, as, as, as Stephen said, um, when you create a court, um, you can create it in order to meet the necessities of a situation. You can purpose build. Obviously, you have to protect equality of the arms and, and due process and a fair trial. Um, but you can create a court, for instance, that honors the victims in a way that traditional common law procedure does not. Um, in international courts at the ICC and elsewhere, victims have a role. Um, different courts have, have, have given them different kinds of roles. Obviously in, in Senegal, in the hybrid court in Senegal, it was under Senegalese procedure. The victims were actually parties to the case. You had the prosecutor, you had the defense, and you had the victims who were represented by a Chadian lawyer, Jacqueline Mudena, who was here, who many of you know, um, who was able to present a case to cross-examine witnesses. Um, and that's something I think that, you know, if, if, if it were possible here, um, it would certainly be something um, that would bring the victim, that would honor what the victims did and, and give them a voice in the process. Um, you could have, for instance, the trial, you can make sure the trial is televised. I don't think any of us want to go through all of this uh, and have a trial uh, held in, in a courtroom that nobody has access to. You can write in the court rules um, that the trial uh, has to be televised. You can also, and I think this is a very important question, um, many people feel that if the, the former president was extradited, it might not be the best thing from a security uh, and stability point of view um, to have to have Yaya Jame incarcerated uh, in the Gambia and a and, and, uh, space trial in the Gambia. Now, now maybe that situation is changing, it's certainly not for us uh, to say that, but a special a hybrid court could say, as, as the Charles Taylor court said, uh, we're going to sit in the Gambia, we're gonna hold the trials in the Gambia, but if we need, we can hold the trial uh, of the former president in, in, in a neighboring country in Sierra Leone or in Ghana or in Senegal under English, obviously have to be in English. Um, so it, it does seem that a, a kind of a hybrid court um, would be the best way um, to, to, to honor the victims, um, to have a fair trial, to have as much, Gamb as Stephen said, as much Gambian elements as possible and as, as, as much international assistance uh, as is strictly needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this really was uh, extremely important. We have unfortunately had some experts who have, you know, been there uh, around the world, very, very experienced. And clearly, from the submissions we've had from all of them, you know, it is clear our law as it is wouldn't be able to adequately address the accountability system we have in mind. You know, you had the speaker say Gambia not having, as we speak, a specific law that criminalizes torture. Gambia not having a specific law that criminalizes enforced disappearances, and there were tons of those. And we also heard even if we want to push for prosecutions at the local level, 
that is the problem of the 1997 constitution we have to grapple with. Uh, you know, in law we call it the principle of legality, you know. At a time when the offenses were committed, Gambia really didn't have a law. So these are really very, very serious concerns. Other than that, the last because, you know, mentioned the issue of security. Uh, how safe will it be for this country, for persons identified as, uh, you know, those who bear the greatest, res greatest responsibility being tried before the High Court to bar you for prosecution? Remember, we're talking about in Gambia, people having the right to associate, to assemble. So the security issue is definitely something we cannot afford to overlook. So from the experts, from the speakers, we say whatever we do victim-led has to be led by Gambia. Gambia at the forefront. But the best under the circumstances is a hybrid system, local, but with some international you know, a flavor, like even if it is Benetton, let's get the international bit to do the jubo and all this stuff, you know, to make it uh, the best under the circumstances. We then raise this a very important issue. I'm happy we have an honorable member of the National Assembly with us. So whatever we do, you know, hybrid, you know, local, international, we would need an enabling law to make that happen. So the good thing is, uh, a parliamentarian is here, and we know she also was a victim, so we really wouldn't have to sell that to her, as in, but it's actually a very good starting point. It's always good to have an ambassador for your cause. But other than, you know, the honorable member being here, we know we're going into elections early next year, parliament, because like I said, the National Assembly have an extremely important role to play. You are a victim friend of a victim, neighbor of a victim, you care for justice, making sure the right thing is done. But at the same time, we also have to remember we are voters at the end of the day. Whether we're talking about voters at the level of the executive, the presidency, or voters at the level of the National Assembly, now that we've had the kind of system we think might work for us, I think it's our business to make sure we push for its adoption. It, even if it is not on all fours with all the ideas we had, something that will make sure. At the end of the day, the bottom line is justice for victims, justice for all of us. So it's about making sure we speak to our National Assembly member, make sure we have the right people at the National Assembly so that if there is a need for us to pass a law, we wouldn't let the issue drag on for like five, six years. So all these are things we all have to really be involved in. So it was good, like I said, we had these speakers. And again, thank you all. And for all of us here, thank you for staying up, 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 up till now. Um, I can see uh, towards the end, Sal's voice was getting a bit, but I think he needs some coffee or tea. So I think it's time for us to have a very short break. Yeah, just to have you know some light refreshment. We then would come out, come back, you know, listen to two more videos, and then hear from some of the victims and of course the Yeru Chair of the Human Rights Commission before we call it a day. So we'll have a break for how many minutes? Fifteen. Fifteen. Fifteen minutes. So break for fifteen minutes. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Is that yours? Recording stopped.
ke la banko di ngotela jandi ba nyim pengu wotala na ani ngata halinde imanyan na ke la banko di ngoti pour ka nyim pengu wota bari isenyi nen kanu ila id card la na ya toro fanang imanyi id card soto ana ani ngata ibenyi nen kala ko kilina mu yala ko wala tala sartoti jandi ba nyim pengu wotala Walonko inyanta sanyi tanim fula sotola katawe santola jandi ba nyim pengu wotala Ani vaksinota ni mobe matanto mankana ha Ani ngangi jambe ya ka mule ben ka ka kodo mutaka bonang UK, Europe, USA, Canada, Switzerland and nyim banku to mal mu meto supersonic slater do lade ala da di ma sanji jama gambia banko kan se kodo ta no le ibe dawo da birin carton fokoyna andum batatije hade batatije se kodo ta no le ka bonam bantala banko to birin UK, Europe, USA, Canada, Switzerland and nyim banku to mal mu beto na do ko sone yata atariyata akoyta andum Alana yata Gambia banko kan Supersonics leading kiral siata katambi nyin tumal mu meti Supersonics be banku tan sabani nani leto fata findu banko lto Dung ila Google Play Store to wala ila Apple App sign sign ye Supersonics la money transfer app o download Uke ifa muna fang na safi sola Jaliba mandi Corona muna muto nyale di Nkal jalo lo nada ganyi ne padie Anim pana mo million jama jama Wale pengo ke kabolo bay Kabolo kan Ah Nde jaliba vele ninja lo nada Ninja lo nada ganyi ne sene anda Mandinka, fan canta manja uya. Se fan canta ye sinyo lu canta. Nina fa fa mu fan canto leti. Aluna ta. 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 Kuku jilu 
do am bi sangir du ko ci ben rew ndax dañu bañ corona ta sara kay len ñu jëli ko Amin sore, walau. 